Your file shows no kills. But to become a double O, it takes two. How did he die? Your contact? Not well. You needn't worry. The second is... Yes. Considerably. So, Bond is back. Only this time it's back to basics. This is Bond as we have never seen him before. Not only do we see his inception as a secret agent, but we also get to see a new face behind the gun, that of blonde liver puddling Daniel Craig. Now, many people were up in arms at the choice of Craig for the role of James Bond, but after having seen the film, and if you see it yourself, I'm sure you'll agree, Craig fits the role every bit as well as the impeccably tailored tuxedo he wears to the establishment of the title. Casino Royale shows Bond earning his MI6 stripes. Now, these are stripes that come in the form of the double O prefix granted to those agents who have made two confirmed kills. For Bond, the first, a brutal bare knuckle fist fight in a washroom. The second, as we've already seen, sleek and relaxed. Now, Craig is able to carry the air of a man who, if necessity beckons, can kill in cold blood for Queen and Country, and it's a feat not many other actors have been able to successfully portray since Connery. And it's precisely this cold, ruthless, and dangerous qualities that Bond must possess if we are to believe in the character. It doesn't bother you killing those people. Well, I wouldn't be very good at my job if it did. Basically, what we have here is Bond as he should have been 20 years ago. A hard as nails, lethal calculating yet dedicated servant of the realm, but ultimately a flawed human being. This Bond is no Superman. He hurts, he bleeds, he makes mistakes. He also falls in love, and for the first time we're actually able to identify with a character that up until now has been so far removed from our own personal experiences. You're not going to let me in there. You've got your armour back on. I have no armour left. You've stripped it from me. Whatever is left of me. Whatever I am. I'm yours. Ably directed by previous Bond resurrector Martin Goldeneye Campbell, Casino Royale, which is Bond's 21st or first outing, depending on how you like to look at it, also sees the return of Judy Dench in the role of M in a thankfully much more expanded capacity. The man was Le Chief, private banker to the world's terrorists, which would explain how he could set up a high-stakes poker game at Casino Royale in Montenegro. If he loses this game, he'll have nowhere to run. He's not the best player in the service. However, this time round, we have no Miss Moneypenny or Q dishing out the gadgets. In fact, the gadgets are in very, very short supply this time. The Aston Martin's back, but it's bereft of any ejector seats or oil slick dispensers and thankfully the invisibility shield. All Bond gets in the way of optional extras this time is a couple of extendable drink trays where he can keep his gun and a resuscitation kit, which in fact actually is one of the few gizmos that we're treated to, a miniature heart defibrillator, and even that breaks. <laughs> Still never understood why they gave a deep cover secret agent one of the most memorable cars on the planet, but I guess it wouldn't be the same if you drove a Volvo estate now, would it? But, like the beautiful women and fast cars, or is that the other way around? Yeah. No Bond film is complete without its villain. And again grounding this movie in the realms of reality and not fantasy, we have a Bond bad guy who for once is not bent on world domination, but simply saving his own backside from a group of investors with whose money he has actually lost betting on a 9-11-esque style stock swindle. A stock swindle that has gone completely pear-shaped thanks to the intervention of Bond himself in one of the movie's standout action sequences. <laughs> So, in order to reclaim money's lost and save his own life in the bargain, Le Chief, complete with Blofeldian scar over one eye, an eye that, also in the tradition of the Bond Guy trademark, bleeds blood, sets up a high-stakes poker game at Casino Royale with a £10 million buy-in, winner takes all. Of course, one thing that the born mathematician Le Chief did not calculate on was Bond. The Treasury has agreed to stake you in the game. If you lose, our government will have directly financed terrorism. I will be keeping my eye on our government's money. 
and all feel perfectly formed owls. You noticed. Of course it's no secret that Bond wins the game in the same way that it's no secret that the ship sinks at the end of Titanic, but that in no way detracts. In fact, the poker game, which is given at least half an hour of screen time, is probably one of the most exciting parts of the entire film. I hope our little game isn't causing you to perspire. It is, however, the outcome of Bond winning that game that will leave a lingering memory in the mind for a long time to come, in a sequence that sees Bond equipped with his most unusual set of wheels to date, those attached to his chair. Something else that's as familiar to the Bond franchise as Shaken Cocktails and Walter PPKs, that is also notable by its absence, is the music. Composer David Arnold has decided to omit many of the hallmark signature tunes that we are familiar with, but given that this is a Bond that we are not familiar with, I think this is actually a wise decision. Arnold's talents as a composer have come a long way since Goldeneye, and it is obvious from the maturity of this score that at last a successor to John Barry may have been found. But for those of you who, by the end of this film, are feeling just a tad shortchanged by its overall lack of Bondness, don't despair. The last scene of Bond, decked out in the finest threads that Savile Row has to offer, big gun perched on hip, and uttering those five magical words followed by one of the most familiar theme tunes in motion picture history, will soon have the hairs on the back of your neck going ballistic. Bond is back. Jason Bourne, if you're wondering what that thing is lying at your feet, it's called Gauntlet. <laughs>